Friends, would you stand with me as we say this confession together? Hold your hands out like this. It's a sign of receiving. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Amen. You can be seated. It's the truth. Today, we're beginning a series on uh, an Advent, and we're calling it Finding a Light in the Darkness. Advent is the four Sundays before Christmas. It's the countdown to Christmas. And it's a time of waiting and especially a time of hope. It's a time of believing that in the milieu of life and all of the challenges and suffering that we face, that somehow... God is going to break through. And so this is going to be a season where we talk about, they're not the four promises, but four promises that I've sort of thought through that I I think are true in Advent. Four promises you can count on, four things uh, that are going to sustain you. We're going to talk about each one each Sunday. But today's promise for you is this, that what was destroyed will be restored. That is a promise. What was destroyed will be restored. That we serve a God who takes death and makes it life. He takes loss and he makes it gain. For those who have faith, God uses your suffering to bring new life, not only to you, but to others. Don't give up your miracle. Hang on. Isaiah and other passages promise us, for those who have faith, God's going to restore. Advent the word that we use for the season, Advent, means the arrival. Advent is the root word for the word adventure. It means the story is about to get really good. That something really great is about to happen. And so when we're in the season, we want to be anticipating and wondering. Now, Advent, unfortunately, for a lot of people, because of the Christmas 
spirit and all this, we, we actually find that a lot of people during Advent end up being, many are depressed, suicides go through the roof, uh, breakups happen, horrible things happen very often during a season that's supposed to be a time of, of, uh, of growth and, and hope. And so my promise to you is basically this, that you have a fantastic future. This passage that Hannah read today from Isaiah chapter 11 is this promise up from the stump of Jesse a branch will grow, a branch that will bear fruit from his roots. This promise that what was cut down and broken and looks like it's dead, that actually that root system, that life is going to spring forward. New fruit, bigger and bolder and better than we ever thought. What we thought was a cutting down was actually a pruning. That is the promise of Isaiah 11, that if you don't give up, if you don't quit, that good things are coming. This promise that was written in Isaiah was written to Judea. Isaiah is an interesting book because it sort of begins in Judea and then it carries through the Babylonian exile. And it became a a promise that people who were, the Jewish people who were pulled from their homeland, their temple was destroyed, they were held in captivity in Babylonia, that they had this promise that someday they were going to be set free. And of course, this passage, a child will lead them, is a promise of Christmas. And it's a promise for us as believers that no matter where we are in the cut downness of life, when we feel beaten and battered, that we can trust that out of what looks like a stump, that out of that something new is going to grow, if only we have faith. And it's coming with Christ Jesus. That when Jesus arrives, everything's going to be different. And I don't mean the rapture, I don't mean the end of days, I mean when he arrives on the scene in your life today. Have faith, endure, because Christ is coming. Don't give up hope. And, and I just want to say that Jesus shows us what God is like. Jesus shows us what God is like. And Orthodox theology says that all good things come from God. And when I read the Bible, I do not see Jesus going around harming people to teach them a lesson. Do you? I don't see Jesus going to sinners and saying, you know what, you're a sinner, so I'm actually going to make you more sick to teach you a lesson. And when you clean up your act, Come back to me, then I'll fix things. Do you see that? I don't. Anytime a sinner comes to Jesus and is sick and broken and suffering, Jesus doesn't re- reject them, right? He heals them, even in the, some, some of them, even in the midst of their, of their sin. Jesus loves healing people. He loves loving people. He loves redeeming people. And not once in the scripture does Jesus make someone sick. Does Jesus make someone ill? Does Jesus curse someone to make them worse? That no matter what he's doing, Jesus is redeeming people, not only to save them, but to save those who are watching. And although following Jesus means you'll have to suffer for Christ, you'll have to take up your cross and follow him, Jesus doesn't make people suffer. He turns their suffering into joy. And if that's what God is like, and if the devil is the one who steals and kills and destroys... You must know that if you trust in God and if you have faith in him, not if you live a perfect life, but if you at least trust in him in your darkest hour, good things are coming. You have a fantastic future. Don't throw it away. No matter who you are, if you're alive, God has not given up on you. You're alive for a reason. Every day you have matters. Make every day count and don't throw away your tomorrow. We serve a Paschal Savior. This word paschal is this old churchy Latin word that that basically means the God we serve doesn't remove death and suffering for life, but he takes suffering, he takes death, and he makes new life out of it. That when we suffer, when we hurt, when we have pain, there's a promise in the pain, a big promise in the pain. That something better than your pain is coming through. That a a purpose greater than your pain, a purpose greater than your suffering will come. Advent, adventure, a great story is coming. Keep hope alive. Good things are coming, friends. That is the promise of Advent. And the thing about faith, we all think faith is something that we have in a moment. And this is the hardest thing. Faith isn't really about something I do from time to time. Um, Faith is about time itself. Faith is about having a posture of heart over a long period of time. That is one of the weird things about faith. Ralph Waldo Emerson said this, a hero is no braver than any ordinary man, but he is braver five minutes longer. (laughs) 
Faith for the believer is about endurance. It's not about ha- just having faith in the moment. It's that when things get hard, I still will have, will have hope and I'll trust that even though it's like all bets are out, I have no idea how an answer is going to come through. I'm going to trust my God because he's powerful, because his name breaks chains, because he is bigger than cancer, he's bigger than loss, he's bigger than death, he's bigger than any of the things I face, and he loves me and he wants the best for me. And I can trust that. You can. You can trust your loving father. He's not punishing you. That's a promise. The name of Jesus is a name that redeems. It's a name that heals. It's a name that melts snow. It's a name that brings spring. It is a good name. And it is one you can trust. And that is a good thing. So don't throw away your tomorrow. And don't throw away your miracle because of impatience. Hurry is probably the greatest happiness killer in our day. We want it now. That's the weirdest thing about God is his timing. God's timing is annoying. (laughs) It is annoying. I don't know why, but God is an 11th hour God. He never does things on time. He's always behind schedule, but somehow he delivers when we need it most. Jared Tolkien wove this theme into all of the Lord of the Rings. You see it come up. He actually came up with a word for it. The word was, new word today, you ready? You catastrophe. That's what he called it. It was the idea that right at the very brink, when everything's about to fall apart, a miracle happens and an explosion of something awesome. So I'm right off the top of my head, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, they're defending the children at Helm's Deep and the last orcs are about to kill them and there's only 12 people left and then Gandalf arrives with an army, right? That's you catastrophe. The last, it's like the last second of the last minute, boom. And that's why faith matters. And that's why hope matters. Because that's what we hold on to in this present darkness. That in the midst of the darkness, we go, I know a light is coming. I know God is coming. Be patient. We serve a patient God who is not in a hurry. And it is extremely annoying. I know that. But have faith. He's coming. Christ is coming to break in your darkness. The hardest thing about faith is enduring time. When we're going through suffering especially, it feels like it's going to last forever. And that's the worst part. And we actually plague our imagination by going, what if this does last forever? What if this is my new reality? What if this is the rest of my life and then I die? It's, can I promise you that's not it? Good things are coming. You will get through this. And uh, enduring time is a hard thing. And so I just want to take a minute to talk about time, can I? Do you know time is the most used noun in the English language? We talk about time more than we talk about anything else in America. Einstein was fascinated with time. And of course, you know, probably you've heard his famous theory of relativity equals mc squared, famous. Einstein was trying to explain how time is relative and how time changes based on speed. And uh, his secretary at one time, this is an apocryphal story, I don't know if it's true, but she said, uh, I have all these people calling me, journalists and stuff, and I'm trying to explain to them relativity, and, and, and I don't know how to tell them. And the story goes that he said, if you sit with a nice girl for uh, two hours, it feels like a minute, but if you sit on the stove for a minute, it feels like two hours. That's relativity. <laughs> That although time is, we all have the same objective measurements of seconds, minutes, and hours, those seconds, minutes, and hours are experienced very differently depending on what we're going through and and what life is like. There's a fantastic book uh, written by um, Claudia Hammond called Time Warped, in which she asks this question, why, why do some of us experience time faster and some of us slower, and how does time warp? One of the guys she mentions, he was fascinated with this one as a child or like a teenager. He fell off of his dad's roof and he said it felt like time slowed down insanely. And like he thought about all of these things as he was falling, that this mere seconds felt like minutes. Maybe you've experienced that, a near-death experience. You're like, why was that so slow? The original idea of asking the question, why does time speed up as we get older, was originally presented by a guy named Pierre Genet. And Pierre Genet said that, well, when you're five, a year of your life is 20% of your life. But when you're 50, a year of your life is 2% of your life. Therefore, as you age, 
uh, time goes faster. Did you know that's not true, though? In fact, time theorists actually believe that the reason time feels slower or time feels faster is based on how much your mind is experiencing. So the more new experiences you have in your life, the slower time will go. But if you're doing things that are rote and normal, like in your normal habits of life, like if last week was the same as the week before at your work or whatever it is you do in life, well, it feels like that week went by really fast in your memory because not much was done or thought about. You are on autopilot. And so a child is experiencing all sorts of new things in the world, and it's this amazing thing. And so for children, because even a carousel and a bird flying through the all of these are new experiences that make, because there's so much to process, uh, makes the person's life feel slower. And the reason if you go through a near-death experience, it goes even slower is because when you go into survival mode, everything in your brain lights up. And all of a sudden, you're processing what I need to do, how I need to survive. It's a survival mechanism that actually will help you think quickly uh, in a life-threatening situation. Anyway, I find this stuff fascinating. <laughs> and the point is basically this, that the more you are experiencing, um, the slower life gets. So, for example, like if you take a road trip to somewhere and then the road trip back, the trip home will always seem shorter than the trip there because you've already seen everything. Does that make sense? So, this is what stinks about suffering. Suffering is always a change, almost always. It's almost always something you didn't anticipate, something you've never endured before, something you thought you'd never face. And so everything about your suffering very often is brand new. And when we, that's the worst part. When a lot of the suffering that we face is a change, you know, a change in our hope, a change in our dream. We thought we'd get this thing, it didn't happen. And now all of this stuff is, is happening. And so this is what I want to say, time slows down when you suffer. Bill Hybels said this originally. No matter who you are, you're in a season, whether it's a good season or a bad season. Because of electricity and other things, we Westerners have sort of gotten out of the rhythms of seasons. Winter, spring, summer, harvest. We don't think of the spring of the leaf and the fall of the leaf anymore, especially in Southern California. And so we get out of the rhythms of, of sort of what we were born into. And yet you're always in a season. Nothing you're in right now is permanent except God's love. During winter, the land rests. During winter, there's snow that seems to blanket everything and make it seem clean. And animals go into rest and hibernation. And yet, snow hurts, doesn't it? Nobody wants to walk in snow barefoot. That would, that would sting. And so there's something about snow and, and winter and the imagery of resting and not working and self-discovery and uh, reflection and growth. What if when we go through the suffering in life and when we're in those in-betweens and when there's weird periods of waiting for our new job or our next relationship or some addiction you're going through, whatever it is that you're going through, what if in the midst of your winter, instead of just always looking forward to spring, if you just, well, what if you just embraced the winter? What if you actually assumed that winter was a part of your growth? What if you actually assumed that even though the suffering may not be from God, that God can use the suffering to strengthen you and to make you a deeper and, and wider and a richer person? What instead of always looking to spring if you in, could actually in, enjoy some part of your winter as well. We're so impatient. We always want to go to the next thing. What if we were to be present in our winter? What if, like rings of a tree, every winter makes you stronger? And what if the scars that you face in your life are actually beautiful? who in part make you who you are? And what if, always assuming that we have to build and make and do, there's a season in life where we can simply rest and grow and listen to God's voice? I'm just throwing it out there. There's something great about winter. Without winter, how do you love the spring? Right? 
There's something about winter, there's something about the enduring of suffering that makes us more beautiful and makes our life more powerful, I think. I don't think winter is all bad. I want to make a promise to you, and it's from Isaiah chapter 11. He says, out of the stump of Jesse, a shoot will come. Out of his roots, a branch will bear fruit. And I've, al- I've always thought of this image as like, like a little stump on the ground, and then like a little shoot grows up. And as I was praying through this passage on Friday, I thought of a different image. I thought about when I was a kid, there was this tree on my street, and it was a gorgeous tree, and it was an old tree. And I, I used to notice it all the time, and one of the harshest days of my, I think I was, must have been 10, was when one day I saw that this tree, I thought, had been cut down. It, looked, it went from being a huge, bustling tree to looking like a telephone pole with knobs on it. <laughs> and I remember looking at it, it went straight up, and it just had little clubs like this jutting out. And I remember looking at it going, what did they do to that tree? That was the stump that came to my mind with Jesse here. When I was a child, I didn't understand the difference between cutting down a tree and pruning a tree. And maybe that tree, if it had a mind, wouldn't understand either. But but the thing, the reason the tree was so big and so strong and so vibrant and so beautiful is because its owner was good at pruning it. What I saw is as the years passed, that tree got even bigger and bolder and badder and awesomer and greener (laughs) because it had a season of pruning and because its owner was vigilant to care for it by cutting off its branches and because its owner understood that the depths of the roots are more important than the width of its branches. Because the owner understood that pruning, that winter, that seasons of suffering are needed for trees to grow. Why do we prune trees? We prune trees, and this is from a botany website. (laughs) And they didn't know a preacher was going to read this, but this will preach, I'll tell you. (laughs) You prune trees to train its growth. That's the first reason. The second reason is you prune trees to prevent the spread of disease. The third reason you prune trees is to increase the quality and number of its fruit. And finally, the fourth reason you prune trees is so that you keep the balance of roots and top growth. The roots always must be deeper than the branches are long because it's not the branches that matter, it's the roots. Out of the roots of Jesse, you will grow. Out of the roots of Jesse, Christ is coming and he will break into your darkness and he will bear fruit in your life. If you've lost a loved one, I know it's really hard, but I want you to know that they're watching your life. And the question you have to ask yourself is what do they want for you? It's hard when you've had a spouse your whole life and you lose them and you have to endure a Christmas, or a child, or a dear friend. And you have to face this time and how do I endure that? First of all, Dying for those who are clothed in Christ is much more like waking up than falling asleep. But second, they're watching you and they're rooting for you. What do you think they want for your life? Answer that question and hold the answer in your heart. Let's pray. In Jesus' name, we trust you, Lord, with our lives. We pray, Father, that you'd help us grow and trust you in this time. We pray for a breakthrough and I pray for everyone watching on television and here in our church. Or whatever chains are holding them down, that you'd break them. Whatever emptiness is in the soul, that you would fill it. We pray that your Holy Spirit would come and help us to endure the hardships of life so that we can enjoy the rewards of suffering. Lord, we take up our cross, we follow you, and we trust you in the midst of everything that you are good and faithful. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hour of Power is passionate about bringing dignity and discipleship to hurting people all around the world. As we're getting close to 2017, we're dreaming about the big things we can do. The more support we get, the more we're gonna be able to accomplish. Would you consider making a year-end gift to this ministry? It would mean the world to me. Remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. My mother was diagnosed with cancer, and we could no longer go to church together. One Sunday while channel surfing, I found Hour of Power. 
from that day forward, we never missed a service together. Before my mother passed, we looked forward to Hour of Power all week long. On Sunday mornings, we greeted each other with excitement, saying, we get to go to church today. A doctor told her she had two months to live, but due to the nourishment of her faith through prayer and watching Hour of Power, God decided that she was to live for another 26 months. Praise God. Hour of Power provided us with the opportunity to attend church when we needed it most, but were unable to go out. I still look forward to watching Hour of Power each week with the same eagerness as I did when my mother was here. I can still feel her holding my hand and saying, God loves you, and so do I. God bless you and everyone there. Sincerely, Robert Dyer. Robert, your letter really touched me, and I just hope that someday I'll have that same relationship with my son, that I could sit there and hold his hand and we could worship God together. And we want to say that's just a beautiful thing that you had with your mom. We tell these stories because we want you to know that when you give the Hour of Power, you're not giving to us, to me and Hannah, you're giving to guys like Robert and, and his mom. People many, many times who can't even go to church, some people who maybe they feel burned by, by church and just can't muster up the energy to go back in the building, or people who are going through time of despair, and we are there to encourage them, and it's your support that makes that possible. And something like an Eagles donor, or somebody who gives us like a monthly thing and says, you know, Hour of Power, we're gonna be behind you every single month, that makes all the difference to us, because it helps us know how much we can do, and it helps us to be wise and prudent with our money. So to all of you who continue to support us, we are so thankful. And we want you to know that you are making a difference in the world to your generosity. This week, when you give to our ministry, we want to say a small thank you. So for any gift of $75 or more, we will send you this I am the beloved of God blanket. Whether a gift or a keepsake, let it remind you that you are truly loved just as you are. Your donations are what bring Hour of Power into the hospitals, prisons, and homes of people all around the world. So thank you for your support. Call, write, or go online now.